أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Now verse number 13 يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائلا لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O mankind, indeed we created you from a male and a female. And we made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. Surely the most noble of you before God is the most pious. Truly God is all-knowing and all-aware. This is one of the most famous verses in the Holy Quran. In fact, there are many non-Muslims that are familiar with, with this verse. But you see there is a change in who Allah is addressing. In the previous verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was addressing who? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amin, O you who believe. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing humanity. So if you look at the progression, First, Allah teaches us how we have to behave with the Prophet, how we should treat the Prophet. After that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how Muslims should treat one another. And then, as a Muslim community, chances are there's a very high probability that you're going to be living in a pluralistic society. You're going to be living with other people, not just mu'mineen. So how you deal with God's Messenger? how you are to interact with one another as a Muslim community. You know, and this is a lesson for us. You know, sometimes we we speak so much about, you know, interfaith dialogue and bringing people to Islam when we, we don't even know how to treat each other. We want to bring other people into the house when we have not even resolved the issues of the house. So Allah addresses the mu'mineen first. You know, first you have to kind of build this righteous god-fearing society and then only then are you able to really know how to deal with people outside of your community you know if if you can't treat your brother in faith with respect you're going to treat the stranger you know someone who's not a member of your faith community so then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is addressing humanity and this is also a reminder that the quran is is sent for humanity the Quran is not just a book for Muslims. It's not just a book for, for the Arabs. That the, the message is a universal message. Ya ayyuhan nas. What's the message? And this verse is very powerful, brothers and sisters. This verse is as relevant today as it was when it was revealed 14 centuries ago. Especially, you know, given the climate of racism and xenophobia that we see the white supremacy that we see that's rampant around the world today, the fascism, whatever word you want to use to describe our current state of affairs, dissolution is in this ayah. Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, O mankind. Inna khalaqnakum min dhakaran wa unfa. We created you from a male and a female. Allah is speaking to every single human being on earth. Meaning the 7 billion plus people on earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you all, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you all go back to the same mother and father. Now it's interesting that when we speak about the origin I'm sorry if the screen got a bit dark. I think it just got very cloudy all of a sudden, but hopefully it'll, it'll brighten up and shine. When we speak about this verse, the issue of evolution usually is brought up. That we created you from a male and a female, meaning Adam and Eve. When you go to high school and you go to university, you find that in, in the textbooks, in the fossil record, we have evidence that there were human-like creatures that were roaming the earth for over millions of years, one, two million years old. 
Now, from a Quranic perspective, as Muslims, many people ask that, do we believe in the theory of evolution? Now, the school of Ahlul Bayt, we have no problem in believing that human-like creatures roamed the earth for hundreds of thousands of years or even millions of years. In fact, we have a hadith that specifically states that before Adam, there were a thousand Adams. So we have no problem with this idea of primitive man going back even millions of years. We have no problem in saying that, Ad that Adam's predecessors descended from lesser primates. We don't have any issue with that. The only problem that we have with the theory of Darwinian evolution is the explanation that they give for the creation of Adam or modern man, if I want to use that term. Why is that? Why don't we believe that Adam السلام, had parents? Someone may ask that. Why can't we just say that Adam, he had parents who were more primitive than he was? The answer is because in Surah Ali Imran, Surah Ali Imran, Surah 3, verse 59, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and this was a debate that happened between the Christians of Najran and the Prophet. They were arguing for the divinity of Isa alayhi salam. And you find that, that this ayah was revealed. They were arguing that Isa is God or the son of God because he had no father. The rebuttal was what? The rebuttal was the example of Adam. In the Isa and Allah, Kamathali Adam, Khalaqahu min Turab, Thumma Kalalahu Kunfayakun. The rebuttal that the Quran gives to those who argue that, that Isa is the son of God because he had no father. The rebuttal is that, well, Adam had no father or mother. That, that Adam, based on that line of, of logic, Adam is more deserving. So here, explicitly, the Quran mentions that Adam, السلام, you know, this final, you know, modern human being, Whose aqil, whose intellect has is complete. This Adam does not have parents. He was created through a different process. And that's the one exception. So Adam did not have any biological parents. He was created through a unique process. In the same way that Isa was, was not created in the traditional union between a man and a woman through the fertilization of the, the zygote, Adam السلام, was also created as a species through a unique process. So in this verse you find that you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only does he address mankind he says that human beings not only do you have the same creator inna khalaqnakum not only do you have the same creator but you also have the same father and mother there is a shared humanity and therefore there is no reason for you to say that one group is better than another that one race is superior to another that one that, that one language is better than another language. That one ethnicity is is given precedence over another. Inna khalaqnakum min dhakran wa antar. You have a shared humanity. Now, what does Allah say? Inna khalaqnakum min dhakran wa antar wa jaalnakum shu'uban wa qabaila. We made you that this man and this woman they procreated and. As time passed, you became nations and tribes. We made you into nations, different nations, different tribes. Why? So that 
you may know one another. Now it's interesting. Allah mentions the reason why He created diversity. Lita'arafu. Lita'arafu comes from the word ma'rifa, right? It's from bab al tafa'ul. So you can mutually get to know one another. Now imagine, so Allah says, the reason why I made you different is that you, so you can know each other, so you can identify each other. If every human being was created the same, the same shape, the same color, the same language, we would have a global crisis. If all human beings were exactly the same, we would have a crisis. What would be the crisis? We wouldn't be able to identify each other. Think about it. If we all looked exactly the same, you wouldn't know who you're talking to. Are you, are you my father or are you my neighbor? You wouldn't know. It would be impossible for us to live if we were exactly the same. The only reason, the only way that we can differentiate, that we can identify who this person is and who that person is, is through what? It's because of our differences. So our diversity actually makes it possible for us to recognize each other. If we were all created in the same way, it would be impossible for you to distinguish even your own father from a stranger. And that's the reason why, you know, you travel. You know, if, if every place... Everything that Allah created was the same. If all people were the same, what's the point? To tra why travel to another part of the world? So this human diversity is the impetus for us to learn, to travel, to engage with one another. If the person sitting next to you, if he's the exact same, if he's a carbon copy of you, there would be no reason for you to interact with them. So human diversity is really the impetus for us to engage to learn from one another to travel so allah made us different so we could identify each other so we can learn from each other so we can appreciate each other not so that we can elevate one group over the other and this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because human what what happened as a result of this human diversity, human beings started to do what? They started to discriminate against each other. You know, even if you look at ancient philosophers, many of them, what they used to do was that they would see, for example, the blacks. They would say, people from Africa, the blacks, they have... Let me see if I can turn on... It's gone very dark. Is that better? Okay, that's better. My apologies. I didn't realize how it seems like there's dark clouds moving in. In any case, so you have this, this human diversity. And this, unfortunately, in human history, it led to discrimination. You know, certain groups started to subjugate others. And even ancient philosophers used this concept of diversity to justify slavery. So for example, some philosophers said, you know, had this belief that blacks were endowed with strong physical bodies and whites were endowed with superior intellect. And therefore, it only makes sense that they are the slaves and we are the masters. So they misunderstood the purpose behind God creating people differently. It's not so that you can enslave people. It's not that so you can subjugate or be prejudiced. It's so that you can recognize each other. So you can get to know each other. <inaudible> you know, brothers and sisters, if we internalize this, this is the cure for racism. That racism, xenophobia, these are spiritual problems. If you truly believe that we are all from the same creator, 
and we are all from the same mother and father, it's impossible to be racist. It's impossible to be prejudiced. If you really believe this, so these differences are not meant to be what gives you value. Your language, your ethnicity, your age, your gender, your family background, these are not things, these are things that make you different, but they don't make you superior to others. Because these are things that you, you typically don't have control over. You don't have control over who your parents are. You don't have control over your, uh, you know, the language that you speak, your ethnicity. These are things that, you know, were set for you. They were predetermined. There's only one thing that gives you, that makes you noble, that truly makes you noble, and that is piety, taqwa. You know, if you look at the Quran, there are only two things that give distinction to a person. Not language, not the color of your skin, not what country you come from. These are all arbitrary. Two things. Number one is knowledge. Allah says, هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are those who know, who have knowledge, are they equal to the ignorant? And then, taqwa. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The most noble among you are those who have taqwa. And taqwa is not easy to, to detect, brothers and sisters. You know, taqwa is something that's related to the heart. You know, you might have to live with someone for decades to determine whether or not they have taqwa. It's not something that's, it's not like seeing someone pray and you're saying, okay, this person has taqwa. No, taqwa is not seen, is not, not because someone prays. Taqwa is something that is in the heart. And that's why the ayah ends with what? Inna allaha alimun khabir. Verily, God is all-knowing and all-aware. Because taqwa is not visible to the eye. Only certain people may, if you have basira, if you're, if you really pay close attention, you might be able to determine if someone has taqwa or not. But it's typically not something that's observable. Only Allah knows who truly has taqwa. You know, some of the mufassirin of the Quran they speak about the reason why this verse was revealed, and they say that this was revealed after the. Uh, the conquest of, uh, of Mecca, when the Prophet conquered Mecca, he appointed, he had Bilal recite the Adhan after the conquering of Mecca. And some of the Arabs, you know, some of them were very racist, especially towards non-Arabs. When they saw Bilal call the Adhan, now Bilal is a, he's an Ethiopian slave, dark skin, a black man. Atab ibn Usaid, he says to Harith ibn Hisham, that he says to him that I'm glad my father died before seeing this day. That he this would have been a disaster, calamity for him, because his father was racist. He says I'm glad my father died and he didn't have to see this day. And you see that some of them were even saying that the prophet couldn't find anyone except this black crow. They called Bilal a black crow. The, the Rasulullah couldn't find someone else to recite the adhan. Why? Because he was he was from he was because he was a black slave, because of the color of his skin, because of his ethnicity, they felt that they were above him. And therefore you find that on many occasions the Prophet spoke about this issue. When the Prophet performed Hajj, his only Hajj, when he was in Mina, he gathered all of his companions and he said, Ya Ayuhannas. Allah inna rabbakum wahid. O people, your Lord is one. Wa inna abakum wahid. And your father is one, meaning Adam. Allah la fadla li arabin ala ajami. Verily, there is no privilege given to an Arab over a non Arab. Wala li ajameen ala arabi. And a non Arab is not better than an Arab. And a white is not better than a black. Illa bit taqwa. The only thing that elevates someone above another is taqwa. It's piety. And then the Prophet says, Allah hal ballaghtu. Did you receive my message? They said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. We we hear your message. 
And the Prophet says, Let those who are present convey the message to those who are absent. The Prophet wanted this message to be passed down the generations, from one generation to another, that we should not become prejudiced or racist. And unfortunately, many of our masajids, unfortunately, they are many of them are racist. They are prejudiced. You, you only feel welcome if you belong to a certain culture. You know, it's one thing to have a culture or center, that's fine, but to make other people uncomfortable, to make them feel unwanted when they come to Baytullah, this is a big problem. In another narration, the Prophet says, Inna Allah la yandur ila ajsamikum. Allah does not look at in Allah la yandur ila ahsabikum wa la ila ansabikum. Allah doesn't look at your lineage or your family. Wala ila ajsamikum. He doesn't look at your physical bodies. Allah is not concerned about the way that you look. Wala ila amwalikum. Allah doesn't look at your wealth. Wala kin yandur ila qulubikum. He looks at your hearts. فَمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْبٌ صَالِحٌ تَحَنَّنُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ That if you have a heart that is pure and righteous, God will shower you with His love. Now, it's interesting when you look at this verse, this idea of, of equality, that the only thing that puts one person above another is taqwa. You know, during the time of the second khalifa, there were many innovations that were introduced. You know, taraweeh, you know, moving Maqam Ibrahim, adding things to the Adhan, and so on and so forth. But do you know what was the most dangerous bid'ah during the time of the second Khalifa? The most dangerous bid'ah was related to how Baytul Mal, how the Islamic treasury was being distributed. Why do I say that? Because during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Arab was receiving a higher stipend than the non-Arab. The Muhajiri was receiving more than the Muslims who joined Islam after the Fath, for example. Some wives of the Prophet were receiving more than the others. And this is why Amir al-Mu'mineen was martyred. Amir al-Mu'mineen was not martyred because he prayed. He was not martyred because he read the Qur'an. He was martyred because of his taqwa. Because he wanted to equalize people. That the Arab receives the same share as the non-Arab. The white receives the same share as the black. And you see this type of humanity, this spirit of equality, you only find it with the Ahlul Bayt. Believe me, brothers and sisters, you only find this type of taqwa this love for humanity, irrespective of their background, you find it with the Ahlul Bayt. And this is why it's even illustrated in the story of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein, one of his most dear companions was John. He was a black man, he was in the camp of Imam al Hussein. And when this man was martyred, when he was when he was laying on the plains of Karbala, Imam al Hussein salam, he rushed to him, and as John was gasping for breath, you know he's in his last moments. He received fatal wounds, and he was an elderly man. Imam al Hussein salam, he cradled him in his lap, and he treated him the same way that he treated his own son, Ali al-Akbar. What did Imam al Hussein do with Ali al-Akbar? He put his cheek on the cheek of his son to demonstrate his closeness and his love and his attachment to his son. He did that also with John, this black, this black man. Because Ahlul Bayt, they don't, they don't hold such differences because they were the embodiment they truly live this verse. Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among those who are pious. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to, to eradicate 
any prejudice or racism that may be lingering in our hearts. And we ask Allah Azza wa to keep us on the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Akhir Da'wana. And Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa Ali Tahirin. I haven't heard that argument articulated in that way. I mean, the, the idea of Adam alayhi salam not having biological parents is agreed upon by by Christians and uh, and Muslims, and I would even assume Jews. So if you look at the verse, Inna مثل عيسى عند الله كمثل آدم. So there's no indication in the verse that this is your claim. Because the reality, I mean, if in reality Adam alayhi salam does have biological parents, the ayah doesn't make sense anymore. There's no indication that this is what you claim. This is the reality. The example of Isa is the example of Adam. It's not that there's no indication that this is just what they were claiming. Uh, what was the verb? Uh, 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 surah 3, verse 59.